Welcome, Nitty Gritty this week. We are with Jeremy and BJ of Millhaven. And Cam just depressed all of us talking about the PPP <laughs> loan to I'm get us started getting... that no one's getting any money from. We need to call out Chase Bank. They really suck. That's how we're starting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my gosh, they didn't even let me submit until like two weeks ago. We just need to work with, uh, with Jeremy because Jeremy got his money. Yeah, listen, the powerful people... That's who you need in your corner. Yep. It's all about who you know. It's just about anything else. Yeah. Right? We're not big enough yet. Or apparently nope. I have way too much money with my bank. To <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. They won't well, let me fail. That was, that's a good <laughs> point that Andrew mail. made. Like, if you owe the lenders that were divvying out the money, if you owe them money, of course they're, they're going to give, give you the money so you can pay them back. That's actually pretty smart. So, yeah, I guess I should have taken more loans out from Chase. Yeah. And they would have moved me up their list. Damn it. Anyway. Should have bought more shoes. Yeah, right? Yeah. Should have financed them. That's right. <laughs> Can you imagine yeah, that? they have loans for that. <laughs> oh, it's man. through Foot Locker, but. <laughs> so, Millhaven. Millhaven Homes, right? Millhaven Homes. Do, yeah. do you still have like the three different versions of Millhaven? Like the branches? There's divisions within Millhaven. Versions. Versions, <laughs> no. One point oh, two point oh. No, we. No, uh, just kidding. But what is Millhaven? Give a really quick intro for those who haven't heard of Millhaven. What What do you do, and how long have you been doing it? So Millhaven Homes is a custom home builder. We do designs for people. We uh, do architectural designs in house. Uh, we build awesome houses for people that that want to get exactly what they want. I actually started Millhaven because I was in the construction industry as a subcontractor and. I uh, just kind of saw that things were a little weird. What were like, you doing? I was doing stone masonry. So okay. I had a company called Ackley Masonry for, uh, we started in 90, 98, actually started 97 and did that for a long, long time. Where'd that come from? Was your dad in the in that world at all or no? No, no. My brothers were working for a company and they were, I was in high school and just uh, got out for summer, right? And that was my senior year. And they were said, hey, you got to come work with us. And I was so stupid. And I did it. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. All they said, is, hey, you get to keep your shirt off. And he's like, okay, I'm in. Done. I can work without a shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I was dumb. And I was like, yes, let's do it. Because then I got to start a company. So I started that company with my brothers at 18. So... I've been on my own doing uh, an entrepreneur type life since 18 years old. Um, yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was literally hell. Like the first the first five to seven years of that company. Why did you choose stonework? That doesn't seem like a common thing. I don't know. My brothers were just doing it, and I was like, "Yeah, okay, I can. Sure, let's let's it's do." It's really this. fun work in the summer. Yeah, like on. <laughs> Honestly, like you get your shirt and you just take it off <laughs> and you put, you just leave it in the truck. Sometimes like when you take a drink from your soda, there's a wasp in the straw. Oh you know? my gosh. Like you get that too. Those are perks. But uh but yeah, no, I worked there as a uh, as a laborer for 5 years before I took that over uh financially like I just said, "Look guys, like this isn't working. You guys have had your crack at it um this is not going well so i'm actually gonna leave and they said no you can't leave and i'm like okay well the only way i'm staying is if i'm in charge of the money like and these I, are older brothers yeah yeah i'm the youngest uh i'm actually the youngest of seven um and uh yeah, that didn't, there was How'd that conversation uh, go? I was gonna it's say, a this... lot more calm than i'm making it sound like they were it was almost to blows and things like that, but you know, with brothers. And so I just said, Hey, you mean it was a lot, a lot less calm than you're making it sound right now. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> my bad. Um, oh. but yeah, that was a, that was an interesting day, but yeah. So I just took over at that point. They, I said, look, nobody can take another dime without it going through me. Um, money's always just kind of made sense to me and discipline and, and money. And so, I took that over and literally like the next day I found out what I'd gotten myself into and it was not good. It was like you have to crack the books finally. Oh yeah. I I looked in there and uh, we had two, th 200 and I think 30 in accounts payable 
And in receivables, we had 30. And I was like, oh, what? What is going on here? Like, what? So then I went into the next two years of my life and worked uh, tirelessly to... Did they keep working? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, actually, two of them left within the next year. Um, one of them left within like the next two months and he the just, company wasn't paying for their truck anymore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Shut up. Was it something like that? Well, he did one of, <laughs> one of them did leave and he took the truck <laughs> 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 and we had to go get it back. <laughs> um, but, uh, oh my but yeah. gosh, could you imagine? Oh, no, it was, it was unreal. And, and it's, it's interesting though. Cause like everything I've, learned in business like it's all about doing what you say you're gonna do being trustworthy communicating with people like to take over that company with in that state was just it's terrible but those relationships that i have with those vendors that i worked with and worked through like our relationships were so solid and and uh like those guys are awesome like well, to work with you us. can't pay for an education like that either i mean uh, digging yourself I, out like yeah. that oh, i mean yeah <laughs> you can pay maybe for that's it. the wrong way to uh <laughs> yeah you pay for it you by can't not learn that getting in school paid. how about that yeah. you can't learn that in school what well, is interesting or emotionally though, yeah when, when i took it over we had six people and i think we did seven hundred thousand in revenue in a year right and uh, this was back how long this was in 2003 okay. i think and then we took that, like built that company to uh, 85 employees and doing 7 million a year. And, uh, you know, just, just all doing just stone all, work, only stone. So like all we did was stone masonry, not brick, not stucco. And stone masons are funny because we think we're the best. Like we just like look down, <laughs> we just look down on you. Did you just judge the, everyone? The oh, yeah. It's like, it's like, Oh, you do stucco. Like, oh, oh you're a brick you're guy. Some ghetto. Yeah. You're a brick guy. You need a stencil for your shoes. <laughs> Ouch. That yeah. Stuff like that. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, that's, that's kind of where I started. But in 08, we just, you know, we, we got hammered, but for me, I was like, I will not, I will not uh, go out of business over this. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna declare bankruptcy. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna make sure that that all the commitments that I made are are done, no matter what. And that was <clears throat> that was a rough, rough time. We didn't, you know, not taking paychecks and making sure that everybody else was getting paid and and. Uh, you know. Did you have partners at that time or was it just you? So one brother was left at okay. that time and he's awesome. He's, he's, uh, he's still actually doing it. So I sold that company, my interest in that about, I think in 2011, I sold that, but I had already started Millhaven. Okay. I started Millhaven in 2009. BJ, BJ was a subcontractor mm -hmm. and, uh, he was running a, a granite company or a countertop company. Uh, and it was, it's funny. Like you should just tell them like your side. I thought I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go and build these houses and it's going to be awesome. I'm like, I was like all gung ho. And then to hear it from his side, it's pretty funny. You know? So, so it was 2008, right? Uh, yeah. When, you, it's, when like when technically it started in 2009, I came in 2008. 2008. Yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> I knew Jeremy from high school. He's younger. Um, and, and I knew his brothers and they, they were always known as some tough dudes around the block. You didn't mess around with the Ackleys. Uh, but, uh, unless you're the younger brother and then you tell him to get the out. <laughs> <Yeah. fire. laughs> um, Repossess their vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> so he shows up at, uh, I, I'm, we're doing these countertops for, you know, all, all these high end custom builders. And he shows up and says, you were doing countertops at the time right mm -hmm. yeah and 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 he says hey i'm, I'm gonna start this company and I, I want you guys to do the countertops and i was like all right cool and i'm looking around like do you realize we just like everybody just lost everything like starting a home building company right now you're like you're crazy but i didn't tell him that you know but i was just kind of when he left i was like that guy he's just as weird as everyone says he was <laughs> 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 and uh so i was like all right cool you know i, I just didn't think anything of it 
but you know, fast forward, um, Millhaven became very quickly the top account, um, at our company. Um, and I noticed something very, very different with their clients because I would deal with all the clients that came in and I dealt with all these other builders clients. And there were so many that were unhappy that were working with these very reputable builders. They weren't happy with budgets and they weren't happy with how things had gone. And we were kind of towards the end of the process. And so I, I had a realistic yeah, they're experience. Tired by the time they get to you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I'd get these people from Millhaven and they were just like, they were fresh, you know, like they, they, <laughs> oh yeah, hey, let's pick this, let's pick that. And, and budgets were on and timelines were on. And so one of the things that Jeremy did that was really smart, um, and I agreed to because I didn't, I didn't think it was a big deal. Um, he said, look, if you'll guarantee a better timeline and a little better price um, than what you're currently giving, we'll always keep loyal to you and, and have you do our work. And, and I was like, oh, okay. But that, that was normal. Just, uh, I don't know if it's normal. It's, it's intelligent. Um, but like, I mean, you know, do other, do a lot of other builders do stuff like that? I don't, I don't know that. I, I mean, I can't speak for every builder, yeah. but, but it seems to me from, from my experience in that trade partner world prior to coming as in as a general contractor, there is a, a, a great deal of loyalty that exists within our company but it's not just a loyalty because we're friends. It's a loyalty because of a service relationship type. You know, it's it's an integrity thing. We we're not just going to line up because you and I are cool. Because we still have to care about our client. We line up because you're going to do something that we can count on. It's your service and it's your you know pricing and it's your your schedule and it's your uh, ability to to deliver a great craft with pride and and that's why we're loyal to guys more so I think than a lot of general contractors who are just flipping through trades to find the best price but it it kind of backfires I, right. I I think it my dad's a general contractor and it's always been kind of cool to see his subs like to me that's what makes a good general contractor is if your subs are happy that says a lot about you right because yeah. some the price guys they can't get anybody to get in there to do the work yeah you know, their, their customers will be waiting forever. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's interesting. I think that's a huge deal with, with that industry. Well, and it was interesting for when we, when we started, like when I came to BJ, um, before that I was a subcontractor. So I'd worked side by side with a ton of really great, uh, subs, you know, like other guys that are doing exteriors and framing and finish and all these different things. Um, and I'm working with them up in promontory, uh, as a sub doing, uh, you know, like multi-million dollar houses. That's why you thought you were better than everybody. <laughs> you were working in promontory. That may, yeah, that may have been. Yeah. Mm -hmm. something. It's like my brother. He does woodwork. Like all his, he's a finished carpenter and yeah. he's like, it's all up there. I was like, yeah, you're kind of snotty now. You're snooty right now. <laughs> kind of a douche. Yeah. I, I feel like I haven't crossed the douche yeah, no, you're good. line yet. I mean, <laughs> I've been camping. I'm sure there's I've, some. People. I've seen it. It's been a while, but it's a very nice person. But uh, yeah, it was just interesting, to, you know, because going with these guys and saying, "Hey, we're gonna, I'm gonna start this thing," and and I would love working with you guys side by side. Let's let's go and. How does that thought process go? Because I don't know that. I mean, it's within the same industry, but I don't know that that's common that you go from a sub to like a full blown. No. Builder, right? That, I don't no. feel like that happens very often. So That's the wild, wild west, though, man. So I 2008, think two thousand eight. Yeah, mean, like is, is that what it was? Is more out of necessity? No. So for me, like I always wanted to be a general. Like I wanted to go to the general side of things. I'm actually like just an. I'm a, what they call a serial, what I call myself as a serial entrepreneur. Yeah. Like I've just got an entrepreneurial mind and like repossessing I've always, your brother's truck would say, well, I'm would not, confirm that. not a douche. <laughs> no, that's not a douche. Honestly, that's like, you got to do what you got to do. If you're an entrepreneur, dude, I'll go repossess my wife's car. If it's like, she's taking it from the business. Like, cause you, you know, you, you, have, you have, yeah, no, she knows I would. you have to care. You have to care. Right. Yeah. And I mean, what's the point of owning a business if that's the type of stuff yeah. that's making you lose money? And so, yeah, I think it says a lot about you. But to be completely honest, the reason I made that jump, it was watching uh, from 08, from doing really, really well to watching all of that going down the tubes. Like we literally had, we had 2.4 million in accounts receivable. 
when we went off this cliff, I was sitting in my banker's office talking about building another building. I was like, hey, we're going to build this building. It's going to be a great showroom. We can do all these great things. And he, and we're everything's peachy rainbows and cupcakes. And he literally like looks at his screen and he looks back at me and he's like, hey, there's something hitting your account right now. Like something just got returned. And I'm like, what? And this is like literally the like, the first of 08, like January 1st. Like and I had before it kind of, well, I had just prepaid all these invoices. Cause I'm like, okay, yeah. Taxes, blah, blah, blah. You were on a pet cash basis. Like I'm going to make sure that all these things are paid. And then he tells me, uh, yeah. So two checks looks like from the same guy, $88,000 has just come back. And I'm like, what? You know, so that was how I rung in this. The, the, <laughs> you figured the it out in your banker's in my, office. Literally in my banker's office. Oh, gosh. Like mid conversation of like puppies and kittens and rainbows. And yeah. I bought my first house about three weeks before that. Oh, oh, I'm wow. sorry, man. <laughs> yeah, me too. August of 2007. Yeah. Wow. Cut and, in half like two months later. <laughs> yeah. That 2.4 went down to 1.2 real quick. We were getting bankruptcy notices instead of checks. Um, and yeah, so it like, was like, how did you stay afloat? Cause so many guys like to your point, either went out of business, filed bankruptcy. So like, how are you able to weather that? Uh, I took out a HELOC on my house and I was able to keep paying people. And I worked with, with vendors and that, that would work with me. And, and, uh, you know, just, we did everything that we could to, to stay alive. And, and we did, we, like, we didn't go out of business Thank you know, thank goodness. Uh, but it was hard. Like I, I literally didn't take a paycheck for 18 months and I was just watching my savings and my, you know, savings account go down, my HELOCs going up. And I was like, Holy crap. Like I am, I'm, this, this is going to be bad. And how hard is it to you be feeling that, and watching maybe bigger name guys doing the exact opposite, not paying their bills or filing yeah. and get out, you know, getting out of stuff, you yeah. know, like. That's a good question because I watch people, they, they bankrupt one company and start up another uh -huh. one like the next week. And then they're all their debts were taken care of. But you know, like, honestly, like I have to sleep at night. I know what I do. Like I am not going to do that. Like I, I just said, you know what, this is going to be hard, but I can't do that. Like, I can't just put this all on somebody else. And, yeah. and, and I got to say to, to me, it's, it's hard to describe that to somebody, but I mean, I wasn't around when he was going through that, but knowing the story and talking to people who saw him go through it, to me, that was a hundred percent the, the, the reason that I felt kind of endeared to be a part of this company is because the backbone was based on integrity because there's a lot of guys that would have tucked and run or stopped communicating, you know, or just hit out until things blew over. And I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad who's gone through that or, or maybe is facing that, but Jeremy just has a track record of accepting things that are hard and then facing them and then being upright with people, you know, going and communicating and, and trying to work through it. And I think, to me, that was the big difference is that he was willing to keep open lines of communication, even though it really sucked to have to talk about it. And then he just worked through it. And now... Well, how valuable is that in all aspects of life, right? Oh, my Relationships, gosh. business. Oh, my god, You name it. Like the yeah. ability to have and face the, the like that confrontation. So I saw... Do you know who Lewis Howes is? So he's a big like podcast guy. But he had a tweet this week. Like, there's a common phrase like "fake it till you make it." You know, in the business mm -hmm. entrepreneur world, "fake it till you make it." And I he's like, that on Boiler Room." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, that's act as if. <laughs> Excuse me. Go ahead. Coffee's for closers. <laughs> <laughs> but he changed and he said, "Face it till you make it." And I mm -hmm. thought that that little that's change good. is huge because that's what you did. You faced it. That's you were, you looked it right in the eye. And you dealt with what was in front of you, and that's how it worked, right? And you know what's funny? Jeremy won't talk about this because he, he actually is a really humble guy. It's I'm I'm his hype man. <laughs> <laughs> but the 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 benefits now, when we go into business and where we've worked through, or he had worked through some of those things with the bank, there's a trust factor that's already on the table before the deal even gets brought up. 
because people know his reputation and know. So I think there's a lot of things that we get into that maybe other people our same size wouldn't have been able to because there's a track record there of integrity and trust already. And so not only did it help him through, it's paying continuous dividends now because of the relationships that were gained during that hard time. Where'd that come from? Like, have you always just kind of had that as part of who you are? You mean just like the honesty part of it? Yeah. I can tell you're really comfortable about us talking about all these good things about you. Yeah, honestly, like it, there's nothing that makes me more uncomfortable <laughs> than, hopefully, than, hopefully than, people than are talking about myself. And my boys. I hope you're watching the YouTube because he's yeah. just kind of sitting still over there like, okay, can we talk about sports or <laughs> something else? <laughs> but yeah, so like to watch my dad just be honest in everything that he did. What did you he know? do? Like he was a civil engineer. Okay. Um, and so he, he did uh, a lot of subdivision work for people, like surveying and things he didn't like that. The uh, roundabout, did he? No. Okay, good. No, I like him still. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, watching him just work his tail off, and then be just completely honest with people, and and see how people treated him, and like when they saw him, like they were so excited, and uh, you know he's just a good, good dude. Um, and and I saw that, and you you as you go through life, you see maybe people or situations where they don't do that. And, uh, well, to be, to can be completely honest with you guys. Like I had an experience when I was 17 years old with where I lied to my friend's dad about where he was. He was off with his girlfriend and I lied to his dad. His dad called me at like one o'clock at night and back then, you know, it wasn't a cell phone. It was the phone. It was the house phone. Woke Everyone up. Knew he oh, crap. You. The parents, if I don't answer it, my parents are going to answer it, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I run downstairs. I'm like, answer this phone. And it's my friend's dad. And he's like, hey, Jeremy, where's, you know, where's so-and-so? I'll protect him, right? Dang it. You, you know him, but. <laughs> I do know him? Yeah. Please. You, we'll talk you, off you, camera. You've met. It's not. It's not <laughs> him. Right, <dang. laughs> Bishop Chris, <laughs> so awesome. Come on, Bish. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's like, "Hey, where's where's uh, so and so?" And I'm like, "I uh, I don't know. Like, I I think he's at home." He's like, "Who's he with?" I I don't know. Like, I was the last one with him. He should be home. And you know, as a parent now, I'm like, "No crap! You made him right. really worried." You know, but as a friend, I'm like, "Yeah, I'm saving his butt." And then I get off the phone with him, and and I'm like, "Okay, I feel a little bit like." Where, where's Dave? You know, oh crap! I said his name. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so so I'm like, where is he? Uh, it's a pretty common name, though. Yeah. Right? So Dave. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the phone rings ten minutes later, and it's loud. It's, it's like loud, and I'm like, I gotta get that. So I pick up the phone, and and he says, Jeremy, if you ever lie to me again, you're not welcome at my oh, house wow. you're not welcome around me or my family like and it was one of those things where i was just it shook me to my core because i really respected his dad and his he was amazing and uh and i talked to dave the next day and i said dave i can't believe you put me in that situation and i can't believe that i did that you know and i made a decision right there that I never wanted to feel like that again, ever. And whatever crap that you have to go through right. to face is not, you know, it's way better, it's better than, than that, feeling. that feeling right there. And, and, and his dad actually passed away like really within a couple months of that. And I hadn't ever had a chance to just apologize. apologize. And I mean, I did apologize, but just, you know, like with him being gone, I just never felt like I was able to say, you know, how big of an impact that that had on my life. And, and I just never wanted that feeling. So whenever I think about what I have to face, I always think about that. Like, is it, am I putting off this thing right here for something that's going to be a lot worse? That's kind of like, you say, where did that come from? Yeah. It's like right there. 17 year old kid an idiot kid. Isn't that so crazy though, how something like that can have like a lasting impact and like as a dad, you know, like, did he feel uncomfortable? Did he like question, like, should I really call and, 
should I give it to him or should I just, yeah. oh, he's a kid. He's not going to do it again. But like the fact that he also made that action and called you, yeah. you know what I mean? Like yeah. we kind of, there's a book that, that I just barely read. Uh, maybe you guys have read it. It's, it's a quick one. It's called, uh, the obstacle is the way. And, um, it talks a lot about this. Um, I mean, an audio book, it's like a five hour listen. Um, but it's, it's kind of that same philosophy that you just face everything and you're not going to die. And it, it, we kind of have that same philosophy at our, uh, home building companies because that, like sometimes you're dealing with some pretty tough decisions and, and we're not perfect. And sometimes if, you know, something gets installed wrong or the client's unhappy with stuff, people get a little bit nervous about how to handle that. And we always say, look, it's home building, right? No one's going to die. Like, right. let's just face it. Let's just be honest. Let's just deal with the consequences and let's just fix it and make it right. And I think people have seen that in the way that we've, we've people forget built stuff. that simple, like that simple concept. Like I even, I mean, it's, sometimes it's easier to just kind of bury your head in the sand and just kind of hope mm -hmm. things go away. But generally, if you just, I think people are so, everyone's so scared of confrontation. Well, that, but I think what I was going to say was on the opposite side, when somebody like, it's like my staff here, if you put a dent in the van and you tell me, Whatever, it's all good. Mm -hmm. But if I see the dent in the van and then have to like dig my way through the staff to figure out who put it in, like you're getting fired. Yeah. Like just be honest with me. And and I feel like, you know, if I had a contract come up and say, hey man, I messed up, like how can we make this right? I'm going to be way more, you know, guard down, like, yeah, let's solve the problem. And thanks for being honest. I think people are really grateful for it now because it just doesn't happen as much. Yeah. 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 It's funny. So. This week, we sent the boys down to bed, Cash and Brody. Cash is 10, Brody's 7. And we heard like a pound. It's like an hour later. So I walk downstairs, and I walk into the room, and Cash is on his phone. He's not allowed to have his phone downstairs. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he sees me, like, throws it under his covers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what's that, dude? He's like, my phone. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm so sorry, Dad. I'm so sorry. And he just gives it to me. I just kind of turn around and walk out. And the next day, I'm like, so how many times has that happened? You know, super easy for him to be like, dude, that's the only time it's ever happened. I'm <laughs> yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah. He's like, probably 10 or 15 times. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, so what's the rule here? He's like, I know. He's like, I'm just trying to teach you guys to parent, you know, <laughs> to really just pay more attention but, to what but we're doing. But the thing was like, it's way better for you to do something and tell me about it for sure. than do something and lie about it. For sure. That's you know? cool that he said that. Yeah. So, I, I've always said that if, you know, if there's a bomb, it's better that you defuse it because at least you can brace for impact versus it go off in your face when you're not looking. For sure. Which is why so. I want my kids around in the house, right? Yeah. I want that stuff happening there so we yeah. can deal with it. Wait till your kids are older and you have teenagers and they oh, start pretending to plug in their phones or putting just the case with the charger <laughs> in it and taking the phone out <laughs> or putting in their old phone in their new case and then taking the, their we're learning a lot like right you, now you dude the 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 games that they play are endless i will give you like four pages worth of tricks that will save you a lot of heartache <laughs> <laughs> anyways uh, i got team boys <laughs> that's, amazing. That's, amazing. that's so funny so coming back to the story then so we're in 2008 you're thinking of doing a house yeah like when was the like how long had you been kind of marinating on the idea of I'm going to kind of go all in on this idea. So good question. I've, I've, uh, gone through all of this stuff in 08, going through, you know, bankruptcy notices and things like that. And that just kind of made me mad, right? Like it made me mad. Cause I was like, I'm as a subcontractor, I was not in, in control. I was not in control of the draws. I didn't have the relationship with the bank. If the contractor had a bad relationship with the client and the client doesn't want to pay their draw, like I'm, I'm feeling the effects of that. I was at the end of the job, like BJ was, you know, with countertops, but we're usually at the end. And so I was like, man, I'm just really not happy about the, the situation I'm in, you know, like the position that I'm in as a builder in line with getting paid and things like that. And so like that, you know, I, there's an idea about, okay, well, how can this, we make this better? Like, cause we did a lot of commercial work as well. And there's a lot of things in place in the commercial world, like a lot of checks and balances and, you know, best practices. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how can I bring this into the residential space? And so then I start thinking, okay, I'm going to start a construction risk management company. 
So a construction <clears throat> risk management. I don't know what that is. Nobody did Nobody because does. <laughs> because it didn't exist. Okay. And so I start looking at things and going, okay, what are the problems? Like people pay their contractor and then their contractor is supposed to pay their subs and the subs are supposed to pay the suppliers and then, you know, and the homeowner's not supposed to have a lien on his house because none of that, you know, happened or yeah. whatever. And so I start to go, okay, let's build this company to where everything is transparent, where somebody has to give an invoice and say, yeah, I owe so-and-so for the materials and I owe, you know, this other person. And, and so those checks start getting paid out directly to those people with lien waivers already in place with everything's basically brought to the surface. And you kind of take that opportunity for somebody that is in control of the money. You take that out of their control and, and say, yeah, no, everybody's going to get paid. Everybody's going to going to do this. And, and so that's what we did. And we, we started this company and we were doing everything manually and we went and started talking to banks and hold on. So were you building houses at that time no. or were you, were, you were like a software for builders? Yeah. It wasn't software. Yeah, though. It was, it was like, an it was idea. Manual labor. Wow. Yeah. This was the idea. Right. Okay. And so I'm like, I, I go and we start talking to our banks and saying, Hey, well, what do you think about this product? And they were like, are you kidding me? Like, I love it. Like I just had, you know, this is somebody, the, the president of this big bank that this is national bank is like, yeah, I send my, my people out to go do an inspection and they don't know what they're looking for. Like we actually just, we just paid somebody for a deck and then we went out to go inspect it and there's no deck on the house. And I'm like, okay, so there's a need, there's a need for this. And so we start going, okay, this is, this is great. But before we start pumping a bunch of money that we didn't have a lot of, you know, because I wasn't getting paid on these yeah. other things. And, uh, we're like, okay, well let's go test this. Let's go prove this. Let's do proof of concept. Right. And so that's when I'm like, I'm starting a home, a home building company. Like I'm going to start a home building company. I'm going to build these houses and we're going to use those houses as a guinea pig for this process. That was going to be your proof of concept that's of the houses what, you were going to build. Exactly. Okay. And I had two lots that I couldn't sell because nothing was selling. <laughs> Not at all. Like nothing was selling. And I'm like, so I come up with the bright idea. Like I'm going to build two houses. So <laughs> do two spec houses so, in 2008 and nine. Yeah. And me and my brother-in-law, you like, see why I thought he was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So my brother-in-law and I were partnered up on that and, and, uh, he did one of them and I did the other one. And, and I was like, okay, this is awesome. And I, I go to subs and we build these good houses, these great houses. They weren't big, but they were energy efficient. Like you can't, I was like, we're, we're competing against houses that are being foreclosed on or short sales. What is our, what could be a competitive advantage over these? And why I'm are they like, going to pay more? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I'm like, okay, well basically they can't rebuild the house to be energy efficient. You know, you can't, redo the insulation and the walls you can't i mean you could redo the windows but like so we really just we we took energy star and just like did it just dialed it in like we we made these houses so energy efficient how did you know to do that you were a stone guy i'm just a, i'm just a dummy you know a dumb stone guy <laughs> who's way better than everybody <laughs> no, i'm just kidding <laughs> looking down from the top of promontory <laughs> no but but yeah we just we just thought, Hey, we gotta, we gotta be competitive. There's gotta be something that, that brings somebody to buy this versus that, that short sale or that foreclosure. And, uh, like I sold the first house at, at four way, which is basically halfway through the process. So we had a buyer for the first house right through four way. And I was like, Oh my gosh. Like I was praying every day that this would work out. And, like I was literally watching my savings account go down. Like I got to within uh, one month of missing my first payment. Like if I didn't have some money come in, like I would miss and I've never done that. It's never happened. And, you know, and I was just like, for me, like I took great pride in the fact that like I was never late on payments. Like I, I fulfilled my obligations. Right. And I was one month away from this and I was, 
oh, you know, it's just like crazy. It was nuts. But we ended up closing on that and it was literally like air. You know, I'm feeling it right now. Like I can feel the emotion that I tell. You can just kind of see it in your body language. And it was just like oxygen. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. So I took, you know, I made like, since I owned the lot outright, you know, the money I got from that house plus the lot, it was only like, it was about 140,000. And I put 40 grand back into my savings account because that's what we were using to live on. And what do I do? Buy I another lot. This, do it again. I bought two. <laughs> I bought two lots. You know, I'm like, let's take this hundred grand and double down. That you sounds know, it's like me when I play blackjack. <laughs> yeah. Hey, doesn't work very often. <laughs> so we do that, and we got two other lots. And my brother-in-law, we sold his house right when it was done. We bought two other lots. So was he was he building with you, your brother-in-law? He he was an IT guy, so okay. he he jumped in. He, like he wanted to, so he was a partner in the building company and the other, okay, uh, the construction risk management company. Um, so we bought these two lots. We start building another spec house on one, and then we had, uh, we literally had five people all wanting this house, and they all thought we were playing these games because I think, you know, sometimes people selling houses play these games like oh i'm getting another offer i've got this other interested party and right. like Home i don't on the market for three years and all like, of a yeah, sudden they get six offers signs. the same day yeah exactly <laughs> and and contract pending <laughs> yeah. those are my favorite yeah. and it, it was so funny because we were just like no seriously like whoever gives us the asking price like you'll get it yeah like but there are five other people there are four other people because there are five total and they literally all thought we were like full blowing smoke or whatever and uh well if you're just asking for ask that's all i was asking it doesn't really seem like a game it's just yeah. you know what i mean think about yeah. it, 09 though well i guess you're right yeah i yeah. mean you're it right. was i'm gonna list my house for 400 and i'm gonna go offer them two yeah it was it was crazy true. <laughs> it's true and so w- this couple came in from moved in from texas and they came and saw the house and they're like we we love it we want to make an offer and i'm like look i'm gonna just shoot you straight if you do a full price offer, I will accept it. All these other people will, you know, they'll, they won't get it. Right. And so they did, they offered full price. We gave it to them. The other people were like, what? We thought you were lying. We thought you guys were just playing the game. And I'm like, no, we don't play games. We're just, we're just straight up honest guys. We built all of their houses. Did you really? Yes. Wow. So we built wow. all of their houses after that. And in that time, everybody was going to banks trying to buy all their right. their repo or their REO inventory. Mm-hmm. So me being in me, right? I'm like, well, that's a nice piece of ground right there next to my spec house. Why don't we try and buy that? I'm an idiot. Like I'm like, why why would you start developing ground when there's all this right. REO? So inventory, yeah. yeah. I'm dumb. So I did it. And, and it worked great. Like it was awesome. Like we built, we built nine houses on that piece and, and we, you know, we didn't make a fortune or anything like that, but we stayed alive and we, we built our reputation a little bit. So when did the risk management go away? About that same time. (laughs) (laughs) It kind of got, it, it it hasn't gone away just so you know, like it's your process. We do it on every, every home. Yeah. And uh, that's something that people don't even realize yeah. is happening and that they are so protected. Um, but we do it on every house. But yeah, that went that went away pretty quick because we're like, hey, wait, we made some money on these. Like, we haven't been making money. Let's do this. Yeah. Like, so, so we started focusing on that. And, you know, we then we went and bought a, a subdivision from one of the local credit unions. And it was, this was, was the amazing part about it was, at that time, those big, bigger builders or people with more money than I had, uh, they would go and offer 50 cents on the dollar or whatever from, from the banks. Oh, you've got that subdivision on your books. Well, I'll take it off for 50 cents. So we would go in there and we're like, oh man, that there's a 23 lot subdivision. This would be pretty cool. There's, it was a halfway done. They still needed like asphalt and the sidewalks and curb and gutter and things like that. And so I was like, what if we go in and we tell them whatever's on your books, we'll pay. 
you know, we'll pay that. And you won't have to give us any more money to do the, to do the infrastructure. Like we'll pay that three, 400,000. It was or whatever it was at the time. Like we'll pay that and you don't have to give us a loan for that, but we do want a loan for what's on your books. So just take it from your, oh, wow. yeah. So just from a non-performing asset to, to a performing one, like, sure. well, how did you know to do that? I don't know, man. Like, <laughs> because, I'll be honest with you. Because I you, prayed a lot. Because you say that, <laughs> you say that very casually. That was a very smart move that yeah. very few people know strategically the balance sheet and how to move one side to the other and how important that is to a bank. Yeah. And you know, like my partner, my brother-in-law, he's, he's a smart guy. And, and I've, I maybe just had the guts to do a lot of this stuff. And, but you know, we did it like, and the best part about it, like I, I sit back and I go, I know five of the companies that were offering to buy that from the bank and they were way more reputable than me. Like I was nobody. And we went in and talked to the bank and talked to the people and like those relationships that we have because of that and that they saw these guys did what they said that they were going to do. Everything went great. Like I have the best relationship with that bank and those people. And it's, it's like this awesome byproduct of, of what we talked about earlier, just doing what you say, you know, and, and it was, it was cool. And so, uh, that was, that was a, so that's why I develop, we do developments and we do home building. So we just kind of, I've always done both. My dad was a civil engineer and I kind of knew about it then. The first, it, the first one we did, I made a point to say, I'm going to do this whole subdivision. I actually pulled him out of retirement <laughs> to do all of the surveying, which was kind of weird because he was like, uh, 70 and his knees are bad <laughs> and and i'm like making him like hey just sit here on the transit i'll go run the 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 rod around and right. whatever but uh anyway he was like yeah this is the last one i'm doing <laughs> <laughs> no more <geez. laughs> but it was really cool to go through the whole process being with the engineer doing doing everything with entitlements through the city through all that stuff and that was an education on that first one. And I was just like, I, I'm not going to go hire this out. I'm going to do it. So it was, it was pretty awesome. I, now I hired out with my other engineers that aren't retired. So, <laughs> But the, the thing that's cool that I don't think people realize is when you're the builder, but you're also the developer, you're not necessarily – like there's a lot of times we'll, we'll end up building houses in um, other developed pieces – and the developers have just made lots, as many as they can in the space that they have, right? Because they get the highest dollar. But we look at it a little different. That's why Jeremy's eye is is so keen is that he takes a subdivision and says, what makes the best end product? Not necessarily what makes the best, you know, amount of money on the development. It's like if you were making, I don't know if it's a good example, but if you're making sauces, but if you're cooking with them, it's different than if you were just selling sauces, right? Because you don't have to deal with the end product. And when we're dealing with the end product, there's a lot more thought um, to the layout and, and how people are going to live and function in those neighborhoods. And so we don't do a ton of developments, but when Jeremy does them, they're, they're a home run. And he's thought through them. And, and it's, it's, it's actually been really fun to watch his mind get going because, I mean, he didn't grow up as a developer either. You can't watch that on YouTube, you know, and you just kind of figure that thing out. So, so I have some, here we'll, it comes. We'll call some devil's advocate. No, Sweet. and it's, it's Get not, ready. Just it's not, this it's is why I'm sweating. It's funny. Cause lately Are you, is he I've bad cop? This. Is this how this goes? You're a good cop and he's bad cop. It, it I wouldn't depends. say that only with stuff that like, so there's a few things I'm fired up about with developments right now. Okay. And so this isn't me. Like I know oh, you. Great. Like, this isn't me, like, Let's pointing fingers. It's it's more me wanting to kind of learn. One, so I'm from Heber, and the subdivisions are really starting to piss me off, right? <laughs> well, yeah, that's a lot different than anywhere else. It's right. So why is that? Oh, so, you don't want to get me started on Heber. I've really? Got, I have a 156-lot subdivision in Heber right. that I've been working on for three years. Right. And they add, like, it's gone a year longer just because of the the process in hey, Heber. Can I, can I just say something? When we put the signs up the first time, 
One sign got shot with a shotgun the first night. So, and the second sign got cut up in nice pieces and stacked like firewood. Like, I gotta be honest, to I'd be that guy. Yeah. Like, here's what. So here's why. So I grew up literally straight across that development in Center Creek. Okay, and. I think it's funny because Heber, is, well, there's two things that have me kind of bothered, right? One is the infrastructure around developments. Like, this isn't developers' faults. This is city council, right? Just they'll let people build these big developments, and then all of a sudden traffic is just – like, my my drive from here to Highland, every year you can add about seven or eight minutes, right? Because it's just <laughs> filling in. And so – that's kind of one of my questions is like how come it's kind, of cart, it's kind of cart before the horse, right? Mm -hmm. Like we build the development, but nobody cares about, well, now that we're going to add 200 cars to this part of the town, like why aren't we widening roads? Anyway, but like Heber, every time a farmer dies, their damn kids sell their lot. And Angel gets its wings. And it is started, <laughs> it started, dude, it started with red ledges uh, and it just keeps happening. Like yeah. the Giles, the sweat, like all. Out on that like east side where I grew up, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of people that own big chunks of land, and it's like the second they go bye bye, they just. And it's funny because people in Heber, I think they get kind of torn. I haven't lived there for a while. I wish I could move back, but it's crazy how crowded it's become. And so that's most. Of my question is obviously somebody's going to come in and development, and from what I've learned, I'd much rather have it be you guys. Well, yeah, but if they don't do it, someone else is going totally, to Totally, and I'd rather have somebody that cares about the end product and how things are going to flow. And, you know, because like in Highland, we've had that same fight with uh, the developer out on that kind of farm property that, oh, what's the developer? I won't say it, but they want to change the zoning laws in Highland so they can just pack as much crap in there right. as possible. And it sounds like you guys don't do that. So, so one, kind of what's the process? I mean, are there cities that are much more welcoming to that stuff because they're just going to approve it because they need, they want the tax revenue or what? I mean, what's. Yeah. So basically when you go into a city, they've got zones, like right. they've got it all cut up and Hey, you're in this zone, you're in that zone. So basically the developments that you do, they have to conform to those zoning rules, right? Those regulations. And so as far as the, the infrastructure that's in the city, you know, the cities are supposed to be, collecting taxes and, right. and creating these these funds or these bank accounts to where they can make streets bigger and and improve those uh, basically the infrastructure for the city, right? right? And it's hard because like Heber specifically, everything kind of goes into there and then comes into Main Street and everything's kind of just right there. Right. They you know, they have designated another road that's gonna be going in that is that it's just on the, like west side. the west side of Hebert? Yeah. Yeah, it's on that west side. And so that'll ease traffic on Main Street, right. but but on Main Street, it's already a failing road. Like because oh, they so bad. they judge these roads on on traffic and, right. and things like that. And it's that road is actually already, I think it's either a, a D or an F already. Yeah. And they're not expecting that to change once this other right. big road goes in. So obviously you've got uh, those are things I can't change as a developer, for sure. right? But uh, so when we went in for that this subdivision, let me speak specifically to this subdivision. Right, right. Uh, when we went in there, they had already changed the the zone around that. Um, it was like f probably a few hundred acres there um, to a zone that would allow for um, apartment like apartment style buildings, uh, tighter. Uh, you know, density and things like that. And when we bought ours, we we were like, well, we don't want that. Like we had 50, about 55 acres. And we were like, well, we don't really want to do that. The, the development just, just West of us. So it was already it. zoned for it was, like, Oh, it was zoned. Like I could have gone We in need to know who the city council was when that changed. Yeah. <laughs> String yeah, them so, up. And that's what happened. So just, I guess this might shed some light to that. So when you annex, a piece of ground in, so like Heber specifically, right. there there's a lot of ground that's in Wasatch County, right. and so what that what happens is you you annex that in to Heber City, and you say, okay, now this is going to be part of Heber City, and during that annexation, they actually bring in and and into the zone, they designate the zone that that's going to be brought in as, and so apparently where this this property was, they decided that this was going to be. 
a specific zone that could allow for that type of that's stuff. Crazy that that ever, especially knowing some of the people close to there. Like, yeah. we're talking like old, powerful names. Yeah, yeah. Like Center Creek, right? Because you're right on the edge, right? Mill Road, right I'm there. I'm surprised you are from Heber because you're saying Creek. Instead oh, of listen, crick. I moved there in seventh grade from California, and I never, like I don't understand. I never this. switched to crick. That was, that was against my religion. But yeah, no, not crick. But it is proper. Isn't that weird? Yeah, no, I like it. I actually looked it up, and crick is proper. I actually you just put sound on, uneducated. Whenever I'd go to city council meetings, I put on my boots, <laughs> I drive my truck, and I say crick. Those are the three things that That's have right. to happen. That's right. <laughs> but, and, but, not an IRA, it's an IRA. Yeah. <laughs> So if it's zoned, then then you meet that zone. There's absolutely nothing that the right. residents can do to not have that thing go through because it's meeting the zone that it's under. If you want to change the zone and you want to say, hey, I want to have half acre lots instead of acre lots. Sure. Well, that's when the pitchforks come out, right? And that's when it's really hard for a city council to approve something if they've got a room full of people that don't want that right the the tricky thing though is right now like utah is projected to have so many people move in right like it's just gonna grow you know like you're just gonna be growing and and cities need to plan for that they need to they need to actually think about a different way for density and where those apply right, right. so not everybody can have a half acre or an acre lot because there's just not enough room um, so that's a big thing that's going on right now. Unless they want to pay level. for it, right? Yeah, and that's what they're, they're right. doing. Like we've, to BJ's point, you know, we've in Highland, we've we could come in and do this last subdivision that we did. We could have done eleven lots, right? And we looked at it differently, and we said, hey, we think our clients actually want bigger lots. So let's just do. See, that's incredible for me right. to hear. Like that is not how a developer thinks. And that, I mean, that makes me, I, oh my gosh, I wish. Because it's like that lot out on Temp Highway that I'm talking about. Yeah. Homeboy could build 120 homes sticking to the current zoning. Yeah. And nobody would have a problem with that. Not one person. But they want I mean, office yeah. buildings. They want either a movie theater. And if, and if they don't get their zoning, they're saying they're going to build a museum because that's, you know, not applicable to zoning laws. You can just build a museum wherever you want. Yeah, it's super profitable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? We need, we need a lot more museums. In crazy. Life. I'm like, yeah, let's do a George I would call Washington that bluff. Museum. But, but it is funny because I learned a lot about the process, and I do feel like sometimes it's a little sneaky, right? Like a lot of residents don't really know it's happening. You know, they had to post signs, but unless you have residents like really piping up about it, yeah. if no one's there to, to – like the fact that that Mill Road property was zoned for apartments and stuff, like that – if I bet if most of my Heber friends heard that, they'd be like, how the hell did that happen? Yeah, it was, that's why our signs got shot and, <laughs> yeah. and cut down. But at because least they, they got, thought we were part of that. So at least they got stacked sure. nicely, though. Right. That's how nice people See, I would have done They put it in a <laughs> yeah, yeah. pile. It wasn't even just like, rah, rah. it wasn't like Freddy. You know, it was that like. That sounds like an old guy yeah. for me. So that's really, and that's why I wanted like to ask super the question. Passive aggressive, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, thanks, and, but no thanks. Yeah. Get out of town. Right. Well, and that road, like 1200 and mill, like it's still just like, I mean, I know it's two lanes, but like to your point about that intersection pull, you know, yeah, that, that spot is already so crowded. We had to widen that. You had, had to widen it? Oh yeah. And oh, so that's what, the other thing. Developers, we get, we get the bill. Like we have to pay for everything. But what like, determines that? Because I do feel like there's a lot of lots, like especially like my drive home now. There's no wider road. Like there's not nothing changed. Like what what makes some developers or some developments like what is that line where you do have to kind of improve infrastructure around usually, it first, and you know, not yeah, have to. It's usually when your development touches that thoroughfare. Okay. So, um. But that's not always the case, right? Not always the case. Uh, I've seen some that they didn't make them do it, but then it created a huge problem, like in Linden, where I live. See, that's like there's an intersection that I'm just like, how did this get done? Because I'm like, you wouldn't have let me do this, and you let somebody else do this. Like, come on. So shady business. <laughs> did you get your answers? No, I, I did. Oh, yes. sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. So have you guys no, no. not? Have no, you guys no, not started he, he, up there he's yet? He's talked about this. No, we've already he started. Wants to know these answers. So, <laughs> like, we're actually 
we're, we're not building a ton of the homes up there in that subdivision specifically. Right. Um, it's a different product than, yeah. than what we do at the core at Millhaven. So. Yeah. So they're, that's more of a semi custom product. So we're, work, we're working with other builders and selling them lots okay. as a developer okay. on that subdivision. So when you're like, Oh, Heber, like what, what, what did you really mean by that? Just like the sign thing? Like people, uh, let's put it this way. Be involved in who you elect as your city council. Thank you. Oh my like, gosh. Like be involved because some of the people that get on these city councils, I'm like, how in the world do you get on this? Like right. one of them, it's like, oh, I have my uh, my doctorate or something or, and, and freaking English. It's like she's touting that she's got her doctorate. And I'm like, but it's in English. It's not in <laughs> like urban design. It's like it's in, it's in English. <laughs> that person oh my is gosh. not there anymore. Right. Okay. So because <laughs> people stepped up and she's and also, said, was this the one that wanted like special decorations on Main Street? It could have been. I still have to work in these cities. I got gotcha. you. I, I know but that they're all now. listening. Yeah. To but this see, podcast. that's the type of stuff that wakes people up, totally. right? And in Heber, it's funny because I think people finally started seeing like, what is going on? Like, every few months, another big property opened up, and people are just pushing in as much as they can. Yeah. And it's and so, but now it's probably going the other way. Yeah, people want to be in Heber. Like, sure. they it's an awesome you know valley it's it's right. great and so people want to be there there's it's funny i mean talking about brie our interior designer right. there is a clear divide though between oh midway midway mid, mid, midway snobs for sure yeah they're up on the right. like the stone mason pedestal <laughs> yep yeah one hundred percent right they're like sewer <laughs> oh you're from heber. heber no i'm from midway <laughs> i'm from midway I'm like whoa get over that yourselves the no it's not. Like the Zermatt sucks. <laughs> Let's be honest. It's old. <laughs> no, but you're right. It's always been that way. Yeah. It's always been like my best friends from Midway and whenever people ask, so where are you guys from? I'm like, oh, Heber. Well, I'm from Midway. Yeah. That's totally, <laughs> These they guys do that. He goes, the Heber. people that work for us live in Heber. <laughs> <laughs> so BJ, when did you actually get like full time with Millhaven? And so Jerry, you started building houses. You yeah, build for everyone. Yeah, I started doing that. I think what was it like four or five years into it, I I reached out to BJ because I was like, "Look, we need we need a, a sales arm in house um, that that does it our way, like just transparent and like gets everything." And um, so I reached out to BJ because I had heard that maybe he wasn't, uh, I just, or maybe he was available. Yeah, I was. I, was I, I mean, we had we had kind of talked, and I was just keeping my options open. The the funny thing is, is I mean, I've I've been there six ish, you know, um, years, and um, I kind of had you know leaving details out, but I I had another job that I had actually signed a letter of intent, you know, and they'd already created a sales list for me and a good friend of mine. Um, I I still love him to this day, and I was gonna go it was work his there. Dream job. It was a dream job. Said, quote, yeah. Unquote. So I don't know if you're gonna remember this. We went and hooped. We did part of like the pro look uh -huh. and we went and played slick and mm -hmm. I went up and played with you. And on the drive home, it was when this was happening. Oh, really? And we, I, I still remember like having this conversation with you because yeah. you were talking about like which one of the things you were going to choose. That's so that's really funny. Yeah, it was it was a monumental time in my life because I I was so happy to be going there. And Jeremy called me and said, hey, and. At first, I was like, that crazy guy? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I really did have a good relationship with him. But I'm like, no, I'm getting out of construction. I'm done with construction. I'm not going through the the downturn. And, you know, it's just it's, it's just hard. And uh, I'm, I'm laying there in bed and I just I just can't put it, you know, I, I can't sleep. And I just keep thinking about it. So I, I bring it up to my wife. I was a little nervous because I had told her I'm getting out of construction. I'm never doing it again. And, That's the smart move. Yeah. <laughs> and when, what does she say? What? What are you talking about? Like you, you said you were never getting back in construction. And, and like she kind of shut it down. So I, I kind of was like, okay, yeah, I'll just, I'll let it go. And then a couple of days went by and I, again, I couldn't. I, and so, you know, from a spiritual standpoint, I, I made some steps to go do my due diligence and, and make sure I was making the right decision. And, and it was very clear something was pushing me to go and really hear out 
kind of the situation. And um, I, I got a very clear nudge that this is where I should come. And uh, I remember one of the hardest things was going to my other friend, you know, who I was supposed to start, you know, in a couple of days and say, uh, <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for like creating an account list and getting my office ready. And, uh, I got it. I'm going to take another job in construction. And so, <laughs> but I'll tell you what, looking back, it's, it's the best thing ever because I mean, not only has it been a blast, I mean, Jeremy and I hang out on a personal level too. You know, we do a lot of fun stuff together, but we have assembled like a team of just really fun, bright, energetic, passionate people, you know, and, and that, like, I feel like it's an extension of my immediate family and it's, it's really nice to get up and it's, and you're not like, uh, I gotta go to work today. It's like, ha, I get to go to work today with the people and, you know, we, it, under the umbrella of what we've created and what we still can create. So it's, it's exciting. It's really exciting. What would you guys say? I'm curious to hear your answer that makes you different. Like what, what do you feel like that you do differently than other builders, right? Cause you guys have experienced, I'd call it like the hockey growth. So growth, hockey stick growth, right? Where it's just kind of been crazy, crazy growth for you guys for a while now. Why is that happening? What would you guys say? I mean, I, I have my answers. Jeremy will maybe give you his, uh, I mean, you, you have to have the core, you know, trust and transparency and, and good reputation. Um, and when, when I came, <clears throat> I told Jeremy, when I came over, I said, dude, you have no, I have a marketing background. I said, you have zero marketing. You don't have, you have like a $500 website on trade. Um, <laughs> and you have no social media. Sounds like me. <laughs> I'm a stonemason. <laughs> Uh, and, and yet you are still the number one account <clears throat> at, at our countertop company. Like, how are you doing it? And he's like, well, it's word of mouth. And I was like, well, if you put the marketing on top of what you're already doing with a good reputation, like you could see an explosion and sure enough we did, but now it's become different. It's competitive, right? In this, in this high end market. But I think for us, we feel like there are some incredibly talented and well-respected home builders, custom home builders out there. Um, but you guys will know this, you know, and, and people you've talked to, but there is a business element to running a company. And so what we're saying is we're taking what was already established as the custom home building, you know, great craft and adding the experience from a business standpoint, we've added the organization, the structure, um, the transparency. And so now you're getting the best of both worlds where you had so many people that were building a custom home, but it was just like pounding their head against a wall because it was so hard to go through the process. And so I, I tell people when I meet with them, if you, our definition of success is at the end of your project, if you're not obviously happy with your house, like the way your house turned out, but if you're not a little bit discouraged or sad that you don't get to work with us as a team because we've become so close in our relationships and our, our friendships, then, then we're, you know, we, we haven't done our very, very best. We, we literally should like be buddies for life and connected. You're part of our family. That's our kind of extra layer of, of, um, definition of success, I would say. So, so how do you do that? I mean, getting back to what you said, Cam, it's, it's, Cause I think everyone wants that, right? Everyone would say that they would want it, but it's different to achieve it. It takes time, it takes structure. It's, it's being genuine. Yeah. Like honestly, it's not faked. It's, it's just going and being who you are and being like just genuine with people. Well, and you're putting your money. Where we're not, we're not faking it until we make it. We're, we're just being who we are. You're facing it until yeah. you make it. Yeah. yeah. That was a good quote. And yeah, so, I remember. see, <laughs> well, but uh, one thing that, kind of sorry to cut you off but oh, you're good kind of your point bj it's when you guys are saying that i'm looking at the subdivision and saying you know if i lived here how would i want it to be mm -hmm. that has got to be such a rare thing because and, and we're talking about millions i don't want to say lost dollars because technically you're investing in really great relationships and really great reputation but I don't know if people really ever look at that. It's not I the most profitable cool way to do business. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, but that is real money. It's not in the beginning. 
right? But it is in the no one hundred percent, and and that's. But if you have somebody moving into a neighborhood and just falling in love with it, and then hearing this story that hey, these guys thought about being in my shoes before they even designed it. This sounds like a principle. What's the principle coming it, from? If all of our decisions <laughs> were made, giver. I was going to say, it. if all of our decisions were made on money. We would be a much different company. That's it. But so, that's what sets you apart big time to me. My cause... favorite book of all time is The Go-Giver, and it says step one is provide value. If you if your first question is how do I make money, you're asking the wrong question. Yep. So first question is how to provide value. Money comes second. Your angel mother gave me that book. Yes. So I love your mom, by the way. She's the best. Yeah. So I feel like I cut you off from saying something. Uh, if, if you did, I can't remember. I already <laughs> said it for you. Yeah. The- uh. The, the, <laughs> the structure that we've, we've developed over time, um, it's, it's really, I mean, we've utilized some software programs and we'll so talk a little bit on that because, so I'm, I'm going through the process mm-hmm. right yeah, now, right? It. I am experiencing this firsthand. I'm in the design process, but what's nice is when you talk about the experience is everything is provided in house, mm-hmm. right? Which is not normal in the custom world. Mm -hmm. Typically you have to go, you hire an architect who does the plans, you go to find engineering, you gotta find a third party design. You know what I mean? You're bringing all these different people in. Um, and one, it can be expensive. Like I know I have friends that they paid like $80,000 for an architect just to draw plans. (laughs) You know what I mean? And so talk a little bit about how that's different than maybe someone else. Yeah. We, we feel like, there has been some disconnects. If if early on we talked to some of the custom builders and said, what are some of your pain points? And they said, we, we get these really impressive plans from the outside, but they're not necessarily drawn. We have to go back and make adjustments to them as the builder, or we have to downsize them because they're just drawn out of budget. Hold on. You mean people think... They can build more house than they can afford. Well, never. (laughs) Yeah. Can you believe that? Yeah. (laughs) That's a sidebar. But again, that's not people's fault. (laughs) Really. Right? A a lot of times it's not because they don't know what they expect. Yeah. Yeah, No idea. Right. It's just like bankruptcy. Like, I mean, you could say some people are dishonest and use it to their advantage, but should that be there for them to use to their advantage? You know what I mean? Like- it's kind of like the city council thing. Like me, aim, my negative feelings being aimed at a developer is I'm. That's the wrong place to aim, right? Because they're just doing their job. Yeah, it's above that, right? No, no citizen of a of an area should ever be mad at a developer if they haven't paid attention to the city council. And you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, and and that was what a lot of builders were dealing with. They were saying is they were having to go back to the architects and make adjustments and it was slowing them down and they had to make a lot of workarounds, um, you know, during the the build process. And right. so we feel like as, as we are the plan design arm and the builder, any of those questions can be resolved up front. And we are very, very heavily. And as you know, involved in trying to tailor the plan to the budget. So we don't, get in a situation where we have to BJ keeps telling me I can't have what I want. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew really every time I call Andrew he's like BJ just, it just costs a little bit more. But do you know how many people <laughs> tell you that you can and then oh, I know. and then you're like that, blown over budget halfway through and then mm-hmm. you're gonna you know, then they're gonna be ten times more mad. Mm-hmm. Well and to be honest with you, Cam, like that's what is the most frustrating thing for for me to watch because there are a lot of people out there that are like, oh, I can build a Millhaven home. I can do that. Right. And then we lose a job to them. And, and then we hear these horror stories about, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, the experience was terrible. And they were so far over budget. Like if well, we would have gone with you guys, we would have spent less. There's no consequence right. for yeah. like a bad quote. Well, right. a lot of people just right. want to get the bid, right? Like- they're like, yeah, as long know. as I can get in the door, like I can have that harder conversation later, yeah. but we have those harder conversations up front. You know, when BJ first started uh, selling with us, I, it was funny because he's like, Jeremy, do you, do you really have to tell all of the truth? <laughs> like, do you have to, do you have to tell it? It makes me sound bad. <laughs> there's but, no, no, no. There's but, the marketer. No, but it was like, wait, do you really have to tell them that now? And I'm like, well, you got time for this? I don't have time for like right. all these, you know, like 
I don't want to do this dance and then have this conversation in two weeks. He, he's acting like he said it in a really nice way. He basically ripped me a new one, <laughs> <laughs> if, if we're being honest. And, and, and to his credit, I speak construction, yeah. and that's like <laughs> laced with curse words and things. And he was right. And, and he was right. And we've tried to do it ever since. It's, it's, it is you're experiencing it now, Andrew, but it, it's not a, a custom home is not something you can just like read a label and, you know, run, scan it in the scanner at Walmart. And, oh, this house is going to cost this much money. And so we do our very best. But about four years ago, we had a house go over budget. That was the first time. And it was, I think it was 60, 70,000 over budget. And the guy didn't have money. And we were like, how are we going to get this house closed? And he's a great dude. And we ended up, you know, without leaving some of the details out, we, we ended up working it out, but, um, and it, and it's fine, but we looked at each other in the eye and said, don't want to ever be in that never, situation again. Never, never. That 17 year old conversation yeah. came back. No, behind, seriously. Right? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So change is just like, we revamped everything and said, no, 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 we can't, we can't, we can't ever let a, a, a client get a surprise at the end. We actually had a client that we built for in Elkridge that came into their final meeting. They had built a custom home before. And they came into their final meeting and said, you know, they were, they were frustrated. And they said, tell us how much we we're, we have a checkbook. How much do we owe you to, to close this out? And we said, well, you're under budget by like $28,000. And they're like, well, why are we meeting? What are we even here for? <laughs> <laughs> but they, they had an expectation from their last home right. that they were over budget. This was the big final conversation. <sighs> Let's just write the check and be done with you guys. But it, it wasn't. And now it's like, oh, I, are you serious? Yeah, we're you made it sound like they so were frustrated, over. but they were good. They were happy. No, they were good. Not. They were super They were just good. frustrated and thinking that they might have to come out of pocket. Yeah. More. Well, and you know, there's one thing that we haven't talked about yet. There are some really tough <laughs> clients in construction. Yes. Yes. Like very overbearing, like on like the site every day. I mean, I know a few people that have fired three builders. I mean, they're just building one home and it's just... Well, like I've I've heard it from my dad. I mean, when you build nicer homes, you deal with some interesting people. Well, so this this is what I'll tell you. We have had some more challenging clients than others. <laughs> right. But my stance and what we've tried to instill in the team is that if you can handle a person that's on the difficult scale 100, right. You can handle anybody. And so sure. we have to take those occasionally to prove that we can even take the most difficult client and, and make them happy because then it makes all those other people just like a, a walk in the park. We have been very fortunate and blessed to have some people that are, we wish we could just clone them because they're so right. incredibly great to work with I and they offset them. People. Yeah. Well, you it's funny. Will... My dad, it's <laughs> funny to hear him because he, he'll turn down, you know, he's been doing this a long time and very integrity guy, driven guy. Like he's, it's funny. Like I can notice out of plan, like all the little tricks that people use so quick because of you know because of him but he'll turn down a client i'll hear him on the phone just like mm -hmm. yeah, i'm just not interested i'm like what are you doing you need to meet this person and you'll learn really quick I'm, I'm saving myself a world yeah of headache and yeah anyways it's always been interesting because i'll hear phone conversations sometimes I'm like who in the hell are you talking to yeah are they from Earth? <laughs> so so we heard an interesting thing from some guys. They told this story about, we, we actually were on a golf trip with them, um, going up to Jackson Hole. And and they said, uh, and, and we totally respect those guys. They do an incredible home and, and product. And they said, we had this really difficult homeowner and um, we painted the, the upstairs room. And she said, I hate it. I hate it. She started to cry. She said, I'm, I'm just going to jump out the window. Oh my and, God. And the, the guy that was the superintendent on site just looked at her and said, well, why are you going to do that? You're just going to break your legs. <laughs> <laughs> but he said it just like baseline, like no expression, you know, and, and they, they are the ones that told us, you know, at the end of the day, nobody's going to die. It's home building and you can get through it. Paint. Yeah. Yeah. It's paint. We can repaint it. Oh. Chill out. So, That's awesome. It's, I think we're, We've actually, because we face those clients, right? right. Um, I think what has made us better is to want to be able to work well with them, right? right. And it's made us better because, like, if somebody gets upset or something like that, at, 
you know, if you don't look at yourself, you're doing yourself a disservice. Like it's, it's easy for people to say, oh my gosh, that client, you know, they're so hard, but it's like, okay, what did, what could I have done better? Like, what could we have done better? How can we avoid this in the future? You know? And so that's, you don't take that client. That's yeah. I mean, you could, you could do that. I want this, but that puts you over budget. Why are we over budget? Like that. But but then think about that. Like if you deal with that that situation more than a handful of times, you're probably going to change the way you do things, right? For sure. Mm-hmm. And and you become better equipped to to handle those things, and then your success rate for for your clients is is much much better, you know. And you're able to handle these things, whereas you know they go to somebody else who who's not well equipped. They have a terrible experience and. And, you know, it's, it's just bad for everybody. So not saying we're perfect. We're not saying, Hey, bring on all the hard clients, you know, don't test <laughs> us. We don't want to be tested. <laughs> like, it's, yeah. it's not, we're not trying to say that, but you know, when you, you face it, you can become stronger. Yeah. If you, if you can take a, you know, if you can take a couple 10 mile runs, the five mile runs are not that bad, you know? Well, And I, and I feel like that's easier said than done. Cause there, there are some that there's just, there's nothing you can do. You're They're right. They're just yeah. crazy. They, and so, but I think yeah. with experience, you kind of learn like, okay, this yeah. is how we have to handle it. Or you just say like, eh, this isn't going to be a good fit. Cause there is a relationship like with a builder, like I a mean, long it, one. It, it, it's crazy. Yeah, it's like long. It, it is like, you're like family for a few months yeah. and especially if you're in charge of the job. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you do, you do kind of have to know. I mean, if there, there are red flags, right, that we've seen, like there's, yes. if if the integrity is there or not there, like, it's right. like, okay, just let's go. Yeah. We, like BJ said, we've been really fortunate to have awesome clients. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because people see uh, auth- authenticity. Well, right? working off a referral and, makes it. Mm-hmm. weeds a lot of them out well, too light right because light you know totally so. like and and you're right like you generally it's like you've got happy clients and then you have friends of theirs coming in mm-hmm. they're coming in with their guard a lot further down than you know maybe somebody else that has had a bad experience and yeah. is gonna come in dukes up and so yeah word of mouth is huge i mean mm-hmm. i think that that probably solves a lot of those problems before they even start yeah i mean there's a trust there yeah, feedback for us is is key. And Jeremy said it. You have to self reflect, and you have to realize that every person is different, and it it doesn't matter what product you have or business you have. At the end of the day, it's about people, right? You know, and and we just look at personalities and say, okay, this client's going to need this type of level of service because they're a different person. You well, know? and you probably have different personalities within the company too. That's like, oh, let's put this person with. Oh yeah. There's person. Yeah. Right? We're, they can handle the high maintenance a little easier or, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. There's 24 of us. And so everyone's got a little bit different. They're all awesome, but some people work better with others sure. and we try and line them up. That's I just very think cool. That's a cool advantage to have. That one principle though, of like just owning it and looking in the mirror first, if everyone would do that, every so many right. problems oh would get gosh. solved, you know, like yeah. instead of just pointing out the flaws in others and coming up with problems, like just be the solution to you and- if everyone would do that, lift where you Clients stand. included. Everyone. You, right. if, if you wrote everyone. down that book, you will love when they talk about problem solving. Um, some, sometimes the problem is actually the answer. For that's sure. the whole basis of that book. And and I think that's what we have done a lot is, is we've taken issues that exist in construction because it's custom and it's different every time. And we've just made them a solution. Yeah. Right. So, so parting, parting advice to someone listening, what would you give someone... Either most of the listeners are kind of entrepreneurial by heart or they're wanting to do something like what would you kind of give them as like your, your advice? Can I go back to that, to a question you asked earlier? Yes. You said what, what sets us apart? Yeah. You know, a lot of people will go to different builders and they'll, they'll try to compare them. Um, A lot of times when you look at the bottom line, what a builder is charging or whatever, that is if you can actually in some cases it's hard to to figure that out but in our case it's easy right to look at what we reinvest in that customer's experience like compared to what other companies are doing you know like some companies run their their shop with you know three or four people uh they're charging the same amount as we charge we've got 24 
like we're, we're reinvesting in their experience. So like, that's just money out of, off of our bottom line that if we wanted to run like everybody else and try to do it with, with less people or, or less de- attention to detail, we could, but we wouldn't be able to give the experience that we have. So like we just reinvest like our builders profit or whatever back into their experience. So they're not, are you saying that they're not necessarily paying more for these services? Like when you put a bid down, that all comes that, with it. That is the biggest advantage to us is that you, you can't look at us as I'm hiring a builder. You're hiring a building group with multiple layers of service from architects. Yep, all interior, the way to design. interior design. Yep. Yeah, yep. And that being said, yeah, we do charge a little bit more for specific, like full interior design. We'll have a, a, sure. a little bit on top of that um, for full architecture. Yeah, we charge for that, but we're not charging near what. But it's less than what, going out and getting a oh, third way, person to do that. Because you would have to yeah. pay for those. It, it's the difference between. You know, I, I paid for those somewhere else. It's all, ultimately, it's how much your house costs. Well, we just so put it all under too. one. I mean, just like you said, I mean, having an architecture, you know, or an architect and a builder, mm-hmm. you know, you know how each other well, like, works. I mean, and it, there's, you know, there's no miscommunication all the way to yep. the furniture. I mean, yep. that's yeah. that's awesome. I'll use my experience. I mean, we'll have a group thread that I'll get plans back from the architect. I'll ask a question and I can have Jeremy and BJ looking at the same stuff during this process right you know which is not which is not normal you know to be able to bring in everyone into this to look at it from different perspective and different angles and how to ultimately achieve kind of that end goal has been awesome and and we work with other architects we'll build houses that other architects uh, draw and and it's it's great and but there is that little bit of disconnect you know where you could communicate during the process of drawing uh because a lot of times I feel for the, the, the client where it's like, you're kind of rolling the dice a little bit. Right. If you're, you're saying, does that architect really know the cost of construction when he's drawing that, or this would be really cool. This is going to be the feature of the house. And then we're like that feature. Is it that important to you? Cause it just bumped up your price. Like to for do sure. that, it's going to cost 50 grand, you right. know, which we can totally do. And I guess that's, that's the problem with me is I'm we're way more practical. Yeah, like I was I'm I was born poor and scratched out of living and <laughs> and I I just assume everybody doesn't want to spend more money than they need to but yeah. Well, but that's a good thing. I think that that right there stops a lot of problems before they can surface. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, because you're getting out, because that's the other thing with architect. It's like web, web, this is why my website, like I don't do anything because it's funny, whenever I've talked to anybody about that stuff, they're so concerned about like the stamp they're leaving. Like, no, this is what's cool. This, like, this is how I want to do it. Instead of just giving me the practical tool that I need as a website. Right. Yeah. And I think architects might have the same thing. Like they, you know, they want to have something cool on the books. They want to try new things, but it is really hard to remember that, hey, there's going to be somebody up on that steep pitch roof <laughs> doing this stupid exactly. thing that you think looks cool on paper. <laughs> yeah. Like, they're going to charge us a lot for it. Yeah, yeah they're going to look there. at me like, dude, what the hell do they want me to do? Like, <laughs> where does this guy work? And so it's like, yeah, I just graduated last week. Just because you saw it on Pinterest doesn't make it up to code. <laughs> dude, you know, my boss says that all the time. He yeah. goes, I hate Chip and Joanna Gaines. <laughs> <laughs> I hate them. Like everyone thinks that dishwashers are free and everyone wants the same design and they don't realize how expensive the things that they use are. And it's anyways, it's so funny because yeah. you, yeah, I mean, that's a real thing. Pinterest and all yeah. these, you know, flip them shows yeah. on TV. Yeah. Everyone Budgets thinks they're a builder. They're not. <laughs> and so very interesting. So to wrap up what I would say, yeah, to, what's to your advice? advice for people? Um, I mean, it's a huge process to, to build a, a custom home. Um, and there's probably a lot more included as you're finding out than you ever thought in the beginning. And so you want to make sure that the builder and the team that you go with, um, they, they understand you, but that you trust them because it's, it's not a slow, um, and short process. You know, sometimes people from the time they start a design to when they're actually moving in, it could be a year to a year and a half. 
And if you don't totally love the team that you're working with and trust them, um, and, and can't verify their work and their services, then you're going to have some, you know, really rocky times. You'll, right. you'll, you could end up with a good house, but you'll probably have a couple asterisks in there that, you know, uh, just didn't, you know, it doesn't feel like my experience wasn't great. So, not um, to mention time. Yeah. You know, you guys quick. having your relationships, like you're probably given time frames and they're happening. Oh, and yeah. with, with most, you know, places, if you don't have, if a general doesn't have great relationships with their subs, like the subs are going to go where the money's at. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I, the, people don't realize that's a big deal. I mean, cause when you're building a house, you want to move in, you, you want to get in that guy. And so, well, that goes back to what Jeremy did when I was a trade is right. he, he said, look, I need a quicker um, timeline. And, and as they moved up the ladder, we always knew that if there was contractor X or Millhaven, Millhaven always got pushed to the front and contractor X went to the back. Absolutely. Right. And, and, and when we, you build the amount of homes that we do with the, the trade partners that we have, most of those guys were number one or number two, you know, as far as like, like the amount priority of, and yeah. Right. And so it, it does make a difference. So I would just tell people to take the time to do your homework and, and talk to past clients, look at work, um, and, and quit worrying about, the the price in the column because we're all buying from the same there's so much more to it vendors and trades you know you you really need to focus more on the experience and the expertise that's and the execution yeah right Mm -hmm. i did steal a painter from my dad once (laughs) here with ribs you got it you learned him over with ribs my dad he got mad he's like (laughs) he's supposed to be in park city right now painting upstairs I'm like, well, I just have to get the drive through done. Really, he's just painting really fast. He'll be up there. <laughs> well, he was not happy. So yeah, I did steal my barbecue once. Uh, but yeah. What about you, Jerry? What's your parting advice? Well, I'd say if we're talking about advice to people that are in the home building process or deciding on that, is uh, to not be, um, not let their assumptions and vague answers that they get from people. Uh, be the, be the answer. Like, Oh, how much are you going to build that house for? How much per square foot? Oh, some guy just throws out a random number and then they're like, Oh yeah, he said he would build it for that much. Good. You know? And it's just based off of assumptions. It's not based off of, Hey, I pick this. I want that. Like this person knows exactly what I want. Like we, we go through that process. We know what people are, are looking for the level that they're after. And it's just really frustrating for me to watch people go and get into a situation because some guy gave them a vague answer and they want to believe it so bad. I don't know what it is about Utah County or, or something, but like they, they want to believe that they found some diamond in the rough or some, some buddy that nobody knew about. And it's like, I found this guy and, and nine times out of 10, it turns out that no, he just didn't tell you up front. And now you're fighting with him about this. And you didn't want to ask the question because you didn't want to hear the answer. Well, and you probably knew him, right? Like it's, it's a whole, it's, that's kind of the religious culture part of our, you know, like Mm -hmm. we just automatically assume we can trust everybody and we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So yeah. It's a lesson that people need to learn for sure. If it's too good to be true. It is. It is. Yeah. I had a neighbor tell me they, they didn't build with us. Um, because What were their names? His, no, oh <laughs> <laughs> because he said his wife was worried that if we were neighbors, she couldn't, if something went wrong, she couldn't yell at me. And and I've never, I've never forgotten that because I'm watching their house go up. <laughs> right. And I'm just like. You better be yelling at Yeah. <laughs> you, she better be yelling at For real. <laughs> but there is some truth to that. It's funny. Like uh, sometimes when I like use friends or connections for things. I'm just like, you know what? I'd rather just pay more and be able to just walk in and be like, look, man, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Or I don't like this, but sometimes with close friends, you can't yeah. do that because you don't want to hurt their feelings. So, but yeah, I mean, there's, there is some truth to that. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for coming on. Yeah. That was such a great story. Yeah. You, you guys do an awesome job and it's, it's really cool to be thank here. You. So thank you. Well, no, I yeah, think, I don't know why I was scared. <laughs> Were you really scared? He didn't answer I, for like three days yeah, on the text. I, I really? I sent a text. I started sending like the Ace Ventura gifts and Ferris Bueller gifts. <laughs> like, I, I honestly hate talking about myself. Oh, and- last thing. Where can they find you? 
Oh, right. the, the easiest thing is just uh, millhavenhomes.com. Our, okay. our offices are based in Linden. We build all over in Utah County and, and uh, Wasatch and in Summit. And, social? Uh, just our Instagram is our best, just at millhavenhomes.com. We have a pretty big following there, and that's where our most up-to-date stuff is. Okay. Well, and I so. think these stories are so important for people to hear because- Well, to hear that about of, Jeremy, yeah. and, like the integrity behind- Well, the fact that this started at a time when everyone else was failing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, those are all stories that, man, if I'm picking somebody to build a house, like it would be- So I think this is a good thing is if people Google you guys and want to read about you, if this podcast pops up, yeah, man, there's some really cool, comforting stories and to we'll feel more connected because yeah. a builder really is, like I said earlier, the relationship, I mean, it's, it's real. You have to feel comfortable with your builder. Mm-hmm. You have yeah. to feel like, Hey, I, I feel like I can call this guy at midnight if I'm freaking out about something, which happens what, totally. Oh, <laughs> geez, absolutely. And so it's like these types of things Don't will help people. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Jeremy's cell phone is this type of podcast lets people in a little bit more and makes it easier to connect and yeah. they feel like they know you guys a little bit more, which helps. And so I think this, yeah, this stuff's great. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate you guys. Thanks guys.